Welcome to this session, um, Shifting the Trillions. My name's Sagarika, and I head up climate change at PRI. I'm really delighted to introduce a very international panel today, reflecting the global nature of the PRI signatory base, as well as the global nature of climate as a challenge. So with me I have on this side, Beth Richtman, who's Managing Investment Director from Calpus from the US. Um, next, Gunther Tallinger, um, member of the Board of Management from Allianz, headquartered in Germany. Angela Elmsley, who's Chair of HESTA and also a PRI Board member, uh, headquartered in Australia. Peter Borgdorf, um, CEO of PFZW from the Netherlands. And finally, our latest PRI signatory, um, Sao Kwan, President of eFund Management um, from China. So I think we heard already um, from um, Al Gore about the 93 trillion US dollars he quoted as needed for decarbonization. So where are we and what's happened? Well, one year ago in Berlin, many of you were with us for PRI in person when Christiana Figueres, the ex-UN FCCC secretary, um, executive secretary, challenged our signatories and PRI um, to invest 1% of assets under management in clean energy. Today, as was mentioned earlier um, by Betty Yee, we're really delighted that PRI and our seven partners have launched with our signatories the Investor Agenda. And you can go to the website now and you'll see that it captures all the investor action that is happening, including on low carbon investment and phase out of thermal coal. And we're really pleased that we'll be profiling this at the Global Climate Action Summit tomorrow with PRI represented by the APG um, CEO, Gerhard Olfen. And what's happened since? Well, PRI's been around the world. We've been holding climate forums in um, your market. So we've been to 10, um, 10 cities um, just in the last three months with our new guidance on how to invest in the low carbon transition. Um, and you can see that in um, the conference app. And it sets out the actions that investors can take, the investment characteristics of different strategies, taxonomies, and case studies. And in it, we've highlighted the leading edge practices. So I think the one thing that stands out to me um, from what Al Gore said is about how all of this is in line with fiduciary responsibility and not considering climate could even be a breach, is a breach, and the fantastic opportunities that they are. I think the words he used are sustainability is the single largest opportunity in the history of the world, um, but there is a lot of hard work to do by sector at a company level. So what this session is going to highlight is how our leaders within the investment community from around the world are evolving their investment strategies and finding the opportunities. And I'm going to start first with you, Beth. So tell us a bit about how have you been evolving the investment strategy um, to think about the low carbon investment opportunities? Okay. Thank you. So I guess I'm going to cover a couple things. And but first I want to just say that investing is inherently about problem solving. First problem we're trying to solve is returns. Often it's to try to meet our liabilities. But there's, to make any particular investment work, there's a lot of problem solving that has to go into it. For CalPERS, it's been interesting because you know, we are the California Public Employees Retirement Pension System. Pension system. And what, what's interesting is you would think, given we're in California, I know many of us are here for the GCAS, you, you understand, um, you've, we read a lot about our, our California policies, and you might think renewable energy would be an ideal investment for CalPERS to make. You know, renewable energy assets have long-term contracts, they deliver you know, long-term cash flows, and one problem we faced that was not obvious at first when we went to invest in it was that CalPERS is tax exempt. And we live in, and we have a, you know, at, at a benchmark that's U.S. based, we have liabilities based in um, U.S. dollars, and yet for us to invest in, in U.S. renewables is actually a bit of a challenge because of tax policy. You know, they're incentivized by tax attributes, so the production tax credit, the investment tax credit. So our team had to do some creative problem solving. And I, and I bring this up because I think many of us sometimes we're faced with trying to enter into a new space, um, particularly we haven't invested in low carbon investments, and we don't necessarily understand that other people face problems too. And I just want to say that in the past couple years, we have 
done some problem solving around how to structure deals in renewables and how to basically come up with economically attractive ways to invest in renewables that allow us to you know, deliver long-term benefits to our beneficiaries, but also meet our needs as a tax-exempt investor. And so um, that's one thing I just wanted to bring up, just to, as, a, as a point. And in the past couple years, we've actually invested about 500 million in wind and solar, renewable energy projects, and, and we're looking for more. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, that that's on the new investment side, and I think when we think of shifting the trillions, we shouldn't just look at new investment opportunities outside of our portfolios. I think it's also important to look at what's in our portfolios. And, and one area I want to talk about related to that is related to real estate investments. So probably a lot of investors in this room have a real estate portfolio or invested in real estate. And CalPERS, we have about $30 billion invested in real estate. And it's, um, it's been really interesting to me looking at what we are and aren't doing related to optimizing our energy use in this portfolio. And a couple years ago, uh, the real assets team at CalPERS launched a, a new project called the Energy Optimization Initiative. And what we started doing was asking our real estate managers when they come to us and say, you know, we'd like to have X million dollars to do a renovation on our office building or on our multifamily property or on our mall, we've started asking them to also look at ways to optimize the energy use. Because when the guts of a building are open, when there's a renovation happening, that's often an ideal time to look for opportunities to change how you're serving load or how you are reducing the need for, for energy load. And it's interesting because in the first two years of asking our managers these questions, we've had them identify, or they've identified, um, about 18 million kilowatt hours that they could save annually. They've identified about you know, opportunities that could generate about 34 million in net present value. And that's us doing this without really even trying to be systematic about it. So our next approach for this is really to get very systematic about how we're looking at energy use and optimizing energy use within our real estate portfolio. And I think this is important. And one thing I would say with, um, that I've really appreciated is the collaboration I felt with the responsible investor uh, community when I've asked people, how are you approaching energy optimization with your own portfolios? what is the right period of time to do energy audits or to look at you know, heating and cooling systems for within your buildings? And I think you know, Al Gore mentioned earlier today that, that Google recently had taken, I guess, utilized DeepMind to analyze their, um, I guess, their data storage facilities and found that they were able to save 50% of their energy. And I think a lot of us need to look harder at the, what's in our portfolio for opportunities to, to really optimize the energy use within them. Because, you know, we've talked a little bit about fiduciary duty, you mentioned, uh, Sagarika, and the thing is, oftentimes if we're not looking for these energy saving opportunities, we're leaving money on the table. If you are an investor in real estate in core markets, you might know that trying to buy an office building right now or a mall or a you know, multifamily that's really a class A property, maybe you're lucky if you can get a 7% return right now. Maybe, you're, maybe it's a 6%. Um, but if you invest in your own portfolio and energy optimization, sometimes you're getting 30%. And sometimes the payback's only a couple years. So I think there's been a failure to see opportunities within our own portfolio that we're trying to rectify at CalPERS and that I would hope that others would feel encouraged to, to look in theirs as well. That's really exciting, Beth, and I think one of the key words that you used at the start um, that comes out to me was around the problem solving. Sounds like um, you had to do that internally quite a lot, and now you would like to do that more with the industry. Yeah. Um, so, Gunter, just turning now I mean, to, to you, I mean, you're a global insurer, you're one of the largest investors in the world. You have the largest PRI signature, I think, by assets under management. Um, now, in 2015, um, Allianz made its position on climate change very clear um, during the run-up to the Paris Agreement. Um, and then three years on, May 2018, um, you made another um, new announcement, an evolution of your approach on climate, on low-carbon thermal coal. Could you just share with us a bit your perspective on investment strategy, low carbon, how you're looking at this? Yeah, 
we, we indeed, in this May, we announced that, uh, let's say, on our insurance side, we are excluding coal intensive businesses. And indeed, it followed the 2015 um, announcement. Um, regarding this announcement, one must say we actually have uh, quite some issue. While we believe the approach is perhaps the right one for coal, we do, we do not so much believe in uh, this exclusion because we honestly want to work in a developmental sense. We actually want to engage with various businesses to see how climate resilient paths come into existence. And we do this because we strongly believe as an investor, we do not only have the job to make investments work, we actually became aware that as investors who finance economies, businesses, we also must make sure that the planet works. That's a responsibility we have to take. And for that reason, the pure exclusion is simply not enough. We need to consider the entire portfolio. That's why we actually use an approach to assess the various assets that we have in our portfolios, to then engage with businesses, have discussions on how climate resilient paths can actually be developed. For us, it's also important to not only have the climate in our focus, but think about three aspects, E, S, and G, not surprisingly. Some may say, well, actually, E is much more important than the rest. Uh, for those, I can only say, uh, think about just transition, and then immediately you see how important S is um, in addition to G. For a few others, the G is so important because if you are an investor and you don't consider governance, then anyways, in terms of credit risk and other risks, you seem to have a problem. So E, S, and G all together is a very, very relevant um, spectrum, set of spectra. We do believe the approach that we have uh, chosen is fairly solid. We publish it, we talk about it, but we believe we can enhance it uh, much, much further. That's one of the reasons why we committed to the science-based target initiative. Obviously, we do this as an organization, but we commit to it actually as an investor. And what that means is we really want in our engagement process, reach out to the various businesses and talk with them how they themselves can come up with climate resilient paths. So how those various businesses steer towards the two degrees or hopefully less than the two degrees. And that's why actually the engagement is so important because only then we can talk about this evolution. If we would do only exclusion, then the development would not happen. That does not mean that in some cases we would perhaps continue to exclude, but only as a last step. But I'm fascinated by this idea of um, investor science-based targets. I'm familiar with you know, business setting science-based targets. Can you just tell us a bit more about what you're actually doing with that methodology? Well, so far, quite bluntly, we are not doing much because we just com committed to it and we start now to develop it. Yeah? But it's not such a surprise uh, because, uh, let's say, there are not so many companies so far that uh, really have already science-based targets out there. There is a number of companies uh, who have committed to develop the targets. And what we now need to do is um, that we are starting to work with many more of those companies to see how they also can commit and how they actually will develop these science-based targets for themselves. Very interesting. But the idea is this transition, finding the pathways, entire portfolio, sector by sector approach. Hey, Angela, so in, in Australia, politicians do seem to come and go. <laughs> um, but Hester is um, here to stay. Um, can you just share with us a bit about um, the fund strategy for climate and where you want to go with your members, which I think gives you a very unique perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I, so I'm going to talk from, from our board perspective, really, and how our board's been involved in strategy and, and climate change. And we've really been involved for over a, a decade. Uh, we've very much thought it is part of our fiduciary duty, and but that has evolved over time. But we first started investing in um, renewable energies when we, um, in 
participated in the privatisation of a renewable energy company, uh, Pacific Hydro, with in IFM investors back in 2006. So we've been involved in quite some time. 2012, we moved to de uh, developing a dedicated climate change policy, and that was supported by a really detailed implementation strategy, and that was very much around uh, what the PRI guidance is, which is uh, around invest, engage, avoid. Um, but what's evolved most, I think, is, our, is the why. Why are we doing this um, in terms of our fiduciary duty, which has already been talked about. When we, we launched our climate change policy, our why was very much about protecting and enhancing our long-term risk-adjusted return for our members. So that was about the financial outcomes for our members. In 2015, we broadened our responsible investment policy to really think about improving um, the environment and society that our members will retire into. So if you think about the fact that our members, um, our beneficiaries will be with us for 30, 40, 50 years investing, um, it, it's a very long time frame. And, and particularly if you think about millennials, they will face the outcomes of climate change when they retire. Uh, and Australia is a very high risk country. We um, will face uh, climate change impacts from drought, temperature, population concentration, to name a few. So we've really focused not only just about the money that members have when they retire, but also the lifestyle and the world that they will retire into. And that's really our why now, in addition to the, to the financial outcome. Um, so we um, are also refreshing our climate change uh, strategy now and developing a climate change transition plan, which includes the work around the TCFD. Uh, we've mapped our, um, our investments and uh, we currently have two, two and a half billion in um, low carbon investments, uh, which is 6% is of our total portfolio. And that's across all, a range of asset classes, infrastructure, property, listed equity, and private equity. And um, we know from feedback from our asset consultant that we're actually one of the highest renewable um, investors in Australia amongst super funds, and that's around um, 4%. So there's some, a couple of examples if you want me to go on, or, or we can stop and come back later. Mr. So Andrew, the only question I've got, and I've got to ask this question, mm. is because you, you know you mentioned the size of the low carbon investments in renewables, Australia. Mm. Has it performed? Well, our fund has performed very well, um, and particularly our infrastructure portfolio. Yeah. So yes, I think there are individual examples where um, the pricing has jumped around a little bit, and I I'm think sure. in terms of Pacific Hydro, um, there were some pricing jumps, but, but when we sold it, it, it had certainly performed. Thank you. Um, Peter, so PFZW, I mean, I think what you're really known for, in my mind, is this focus that you've had um, for some time on um, real-world impact. Um, can you just share with us a bit, what's the strategic approach that you're using for sustainable investments? For us, there is only one thing that really counts, and that's the participant in the scheme. Uh, we have about uh, 2.6 uh, uh, million participants, and we had the discussion with them in surveys, but also in, in, in real uh, meetings with them. And they asked, we asked them, what do you think is important for the future? And of course, the first question is when they talk with the pension fund is that you gave me the pension I can uh, count on. But the second is, I want to uh, enjoy this pension in a livable world. What do I have, what, 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 what is the meaning of a good salary, good income uh, when you retire, but there is no world where you can live in. And that brings us to the discussion in our board about our in, uh, investment policy. It started in 2012 and in 2014 we established this new uh, policy. And this policy uh, uh, has three pillars. First, take care for the pension. Second, it has to be contributed. Every investment has contrib to contribute to sustainability. And three, we want to understand and control what we do. But we're now today we talk about the second pillar, sustainability. And for us, uh, it's impossible to do any everything. We can't change the world, and we don't promise our participants to change the world. But perhaps we can contribute. We started last year a campaign on television, rather 
special for a pension fund in the Netherlands to have a TV uh, campaign. And this campaign uh, tells the people try, uh, that we want to contribute to a better world, but not a guarantee for a better world. And they understand, and they say to us, please give me a good pension in a livable world. And for us, that means that we had to change our policy. It, we are an um, informed investor since the 80s. We have uh, strengthened our policy in 2007. But at this moment, we have a very strict policy when we talk about sustainability and climate. The first uh, goal in, uh, when we talk about climate is that we want to reduce our carbon footprint with 50% between 2015 and 2020, and we will achieve it. It's not enough, we know. But on the other hand, we also know that the real economy needs energy. We need fossil fuel. We are not able to skip it at this moment. And I'm very glad to hear today the, the enthusiastic and optimistic story of uh, Al Gore, but still we need fossil fuel. And that's why we still want to invest in it. Not because of the fuel, and for us it's the combination in our total investments. For us it's very important that the companies will change. Our investment can change. For example, we can skip coal, gas, oil in a, in a few years. That's not, that's not so difficult. But it's more important for the world that the companies will change their policy. So I think when with engagement we are able to real change the world, that the, the, the real economy will change the world, will change their uh, energy, and then, it's for us, it's more easy to invest. I give you an example. We have the last month uh, the actions of Greenpeace in, uh, to our front. And they say to us, you shouldn't invest anymore in the pipelines of oil here in the United States. And we invest in these pipelines, in the companies on exploiting these pipelines. And we said to them, when we sell our stocks in these companies, nothing will change because other uh, investors will buy these stocks and perhaps they are not involved with climate. They are not involved with an improvement of the, of the, of the achievements of these companies. So I think, and we think it's better that we still are involved in these companies, have the engagement with them and change their behavior. Their responsibility is I think, and we think more important than only our money. And together, perhaps, we can build a better world. Thank you, Peter, for sharing that. And um, am I right in thinking, do you also have an aspirational kind of goal around the assets under management you'll have in sustainable investments? We call that uh, investment in solutions. Uh, and uh, we want to raise this uh, amount of money from uh, 5 billion in 2014 to 20 billion in 2020, and then it's about 10% of what we invest in investment in solutions. Some people call it impact investing, but I think it's more than that. It's really a contribution to, to create a better world. Um, and I must say, that's not an easy task. Reduction of uh, carbon is much easier than uh, find the right investments uh, with impact. And not because there are no investments, but the financial return and the risk should also stick to our first pillar, take care for a good pension. Oh. And Peter, what um, seemed um, came out to me there when you were speaking was the role of um, kind of fund governance, because you mentioned that the investment policy um, and the referencing, the approach you've got of sustainability was very important. And from that, I assume, flowed your kind of 2020-based thinking. Is that correct? Yeah, I think when I uh, understand you quite well, it's the board that makes the policy. But the policy of a pension fund, a pension fund governed by employees' organizations and unions together, uh, makes the policy for our asset management. PGGM is our full service uh, uh, asset manager, uh, but the policy is made by the board of the pension fund. And PGGM should stick to our policy, of course. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, Sao Kwan, so we know that China's leading in green finance, but it's um, really fantastic to have you as our signatory on the ground. Um, can you tell us what's happening in the market? Sure, you know, in fact, you know, prior to 2015, talking about uh, green finance or ESG in China, basically it's nothing to talk about. Although we did have, you know, some laws and regulations by 2015, but the, subs you know, the substance achievement was not quite there. However, in 2015, we did issue the first green bond, totaling, you know, uh, you know, among, you know, one billion US. However, by the end of last year, 2017, we had, you know, 37 billion US green bonds slash green credits per se. Second, you know, to the US, the largest green bond market, you know, that was, you know, 42 billion. So, you know, give us, you know, a couple more years, hopefully, you know, China will be the largest green bond issuance in our you know, country. Uh, look at what, you know, uh, we did besides the green bond area, uh, take, you know, fund management company industry, you know, uh, as an example. What we have done is very little, not even 1% of the total green assets per se. Uh, as of June this year, the total green, uh, green assets are totaling among uh, 1.3 trillion US. However, 95% of this 1.3 trillion is related to green bond, green credit. The rest of the sector is really still behind. What we need to do is really do more diversify beyond you know, fixed income sector per se. Uh, but, you know, that's really, you know, the numbers, but I also want to share with you uh, what have, you know, our government, you know, done. So, for the government, you know, rec you know policy, you know, bodies, chaired by PBOC, is our central bank, you know, together with, you know, six other government agencies, including po environmental protection agencies, Ministry of Finance, and all the relevant securities and banking regulators to form a holistic body to look at and address the green financial system policies. This is, you know, something of you know, the first in the world, all the re relevant regulators in one country to try to work together to form a co cohesive green financial system. This is something we are quite proud of. Bring it down to the more implementation level. Uh, CSLC, that's the yes, you know, SEC equivalent in the states. Also, you know, published, you know, and announced, you know, this year they are going to make those listed company on the watch list of the protection, uh, environmental protection agency to disclose, you know, their environmental indicators, and you know, uh, by next year. You know, we are going to move to a semi-mandatory uh, disclosure for listed companies. And by 2020, all the listed companies, that means in China, more than 3,000 companies, has to be mandatory disclosed, all the ESG standard. I think this is, you know, uh, definitely it's a baby step moving to the right direction, but I think we, we have the will and the determination to do that. Thank you, Sao Kwan. And I'm just thinking then a bit about um, in, investors. I mean, PRI, we, you know, we're very new. We've got a new head of China, Luanan, um, who's in San Francisco now, on the ground. Um, but what about um, e-fund management's own, own approach and what you're thinking about doing in this opportunity space? So for us, we, we, you know, we have Greenfield, as I mentioned, you know, 20, you know, prior to 2015, there's not much you know, there. So the good sign is you know, that we can De, you know, define our landscape. You know, use, you know, Yifan, for example, we are the largest fund manager in China, you know, out of 128 players. So as a leading, you know, player in the market, we, you know, we have the luxury to really dedicate our resources, set up our own departments, and also working with uh, the leading player in, in the globe to learn and also, you know, do ESG uh, low carbon investment per se. So just, you know, a little bit more than one year ago, we worked, worked with APG, the Netherlands Asset you know, Pension Managers, to launch the first ESG, glo you know, which is Comply Global Standards, A shares in, uh, in China. And later this year, Yifun is going to launch an environmental index 
and you know, really you know, cater and also address local and also global investor. What we are trying to do here is not you know, uh, to sell product. What we are trying to do is grow the pie and also raise the awareness of our local investors, per se. Thank you very much, Sao Kwan. So we're going to come to audience questions very soon. Um, but while you're getting your questions um, ready in your mind um, for that section, um, I'm going to ask some of my own questions. Um, so I think, you know, Beth, you covered um, how you're thinking about the kind of problem solving, energy optimization. Gunther, you highlighted this science-based target, which I think uh, you know, you're cautious on, but seems to hold a lot of opportunity. Um, and Angela, um, you, you know, talked about you've been doing this for a while, but now um, you, you're going to have a um, kind of an evolution with a climate change transition plan. Peter, the focus on um, scheme members um, and um, impact. And Sao Kwan, um, you know, the regulators push and, uh, you know, your own approach. You see the opportunity there with a, with a new fund. However, what needs to happen um, in the finance sector and what actions do government needs to take um, so that um, you can all invest more in um, low carbon? And maybe if I start, um, just I'll go down the line on this side, Beth. Well, um, I'm curious, how many people, show of hands, have been in the room where someone said, when they were making an investment decision or thinking about comparing two investments, um, if only there was a price on carbon? That few? Are we being honest? Because I think many of us have held this, um, have, had, have had those moments and or even had them in their own minds. Um, so I, I do think that that's something that's very important that would accelerate everything. If there was a price on carbon because, you know, I talked about our approach focusing on economically attractive renewable energy and energy optimization opportunities. If there was a price on carbon, there'd be a lot more of those, much more apparent and it would, it would really move the needle much faster. And um, Gunther, what's your perspective? Well, in, in, in addition perhaps to, to price to carbon, which I indeed agree very much, um, we heard it, I, I believe, um, even Fiona was talking, we actually need to work together very, very much. And um, a kind of a danger that I see is we have many, many, many initiatives on reporting, for instance, or other aspects, um, which is very good because we have lots of momentum. However, one could get the feeling that the one or the other out there, perhaps also us here, understand a certain problem. And once we have this certain problem understood, we tend to start our own initiative. <laughs> While we could try to understand what initiative is already covering what, uh, let's say, we think is a problem, and then start to support this initiative very, very much, and in that form, uh, join forces. This would help, perhaps, us investors to focus very much and that focus actually would help us to get what we, in the end, really would like to achieve, which is not to have many, many discussions about initiatives, not to be part of initiatives, but in the end, we really want to change uh, certain parts of the economy. That's what we want to have. And for that, we need lots of energy um, and capacity. So the collaboration and the harmonization of initiatives, the focusing on, on initiatives would be very, very helpful. So I'm hearing some initiative fatigue, but at the same time what you're saying is, actually let's get behind some of the ones and put all our energy and focus into those together to doing the problem solving that Beth was talking about. Um, Angela, what's your feeling? Well, I think the, the key barrier in Australia, which might be obvious from our constant change of, of Prime Minister, is uh, that, that we just haven't got any political certainty. And, um, uh, for, and, and this is really despite the fact that most Australians really, there is widespread support for renewables and climate change. Um, but there is a, a lack of political census, consensus and a, a political action. We've had 10 years of climate change, climate wars really, um, and in, not focus on climate change, but prime minister change. And our, our latest prime minister, I'm not sure everybody's aware of this, that we've changed prime minister in the last a uh, couple of weeks, but he is famous for brandishing a lump of coal in the parliament. Um, and he has gone on now to separate energy and climate, and we were just close to getting a, a, another um, 
uh, agreement around that. So um, that's all been separated out now and we won't have any um, uh, direction towards Paris. Um, he won't exit Paris, but there won't be actually any strategy to lead us there. And what this means is, so we've had 10 years of this uh, instability on and off on, on price on carbon, which means there's but not been any investment in, um, in, uh, in uh, energy in Australia. And we've got a lot of old stock. Uh, and prices, of course, are going up because there's been no investment in, in new um, energy stock. So this is a major political problem and there's really a lack of certainty for investors. But there is some good news. The good news is that Australian investors are actually deploying capital to low carbon solutions in really unprecedented numbers despite this. And this is across um, asset classes and geographies. Um, we've also got state governments, sub-national governments doing a lot of work um, and developing some strategies. Um, and we also have a regulator that's actually focusing um, companies on director duties on climate change, um, despite the fact that the, the government's been um, all over the place on this issue. And Amanda, it seems to me that, you know, for the, those of us outside of Australia, there's a lot of lessons from what you say in terms of policy um, certainty, and that's why investors have to be very loud and clear on what we are asking for and the signals we give to investors. Um, and Fiona mentioned earlier today um, PRI's thought leadership paper, which you'll find in the, in the documents tab of the conference app. And we're going to talk about it more tomorrow in the TCFD scenario analysis session. Um, and our thesis that we've worked out with um, energy transition advisors um, and Vivid Economics is that at some stage, governments will have to respond <laughs> to this, um, and there's a potential for a very hard transition. Um, but I'm going to just move on now back to um, Peter. What's your feeling about what you need um, uh, to see so you can do even more of what you're doing? There are several things that we need. The first is that companies will change uh, their policy. Because when the, the companies will change, our investments can change, uh, as, uh, as I told before. Um, and then it helps when there is a policy in the country, and, and, and in our case in Europe, um, where, the, where, the, where the governments and the European Commission um, makes clear that there is no other way to go. Um, for example, one of the discussions going on is, should there be a real price for carbon? Still, there is no. Internal, there are, there are, but in, on the market, there are not real prices for carbon. And it will help a lot when there are real prices for carbon, so the companies will see my, my, my own uh, calculation don't fit anymore in this situation. That's first. The second is, we are here with a lot of asset managers understand, and asset owners understanding what, 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 what the world needs. But there are more of us who doesn't understand. I'm a lecturer at the Business University Nijrode uh, in the Netherlands, and every year I have students, and these are mostly board members of pension funds, who I have to convince that there is no contradiction between return and sustainability. Still, at this moment, I have to convince people that it's better for the world, but it's also better for your portfolio when you skip the risk, especially on the long term. Uh, so we, I think we have to change the companies, we have to change our, also our own industry. As long as we think that we invest for more money, I think that's the wrong way. We have to invest for more money in a livable world. And this combination is very important. So thank you for all being here and be enthusiastic about the, the story of Al Gore and all the other stories. But at the end of the day, we have to, to, to bring the news to a lot of others and our colleagues also. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, so we're going to have audience Q&A in a minute. But um, just before, I want to ask um, Sao Juan. So um, from what you said, it sounds like the Chinese government's kind of doing everything. Regulators, I mean, I felt scared when you were talking about the CSRC regulator. I wouldn't like to be a company on the wrong side. Yeah. <laughs> so just tell us a bit, what needs to happen in the Chinese market? I think I have to echo in what Peter said. You know, what we need is really the demand. 
you know, how to create demand for responsible investment. Uh, you mentioned, I mentioned, you know, our government really doing a lot of things to make that happen. And as a service provider, asset managers, we are equipping ourselves to build our expertise to do the responsible investment. So what is missing on the other equation is really the demand. What we need is really long-term responsible investor. You know, pension fund is the ideal you know, sector for that. Uh, luckily, we are having pension reform this year. So, you know, uh, started, you know, two years ago, it's still going on. So I think we have a true opportunity to use the reform to encourage pension funds, long-term investors, to invest into the responsible investment. However, what we need is not service provider like us as a asset manager to talk to the pension owners. Maybe you know, sim you know, we should have you know pension funds. You know, those have global experience like you know Peter, APG, and Cowpers. The others talk to our pension, you know, pension trustee, and make them understand doing responsible investment not necessary. Need to sacrifice returns. Really, you know, like a like to use the same language to communicate. I think that is really very important to make it, you know, work as the next step. So more engagement of the um, local asset owners yes. in China. Yes. Okay. Okay, we're going to turn over now to um, audience questions. And um, if you um, raise your hand, we've got some uh, mics um, roving. Um, and um, please state your name, your organization, and who your question is for. Thank you. There's um, one question there, and um, one just down here as well. Thank you. Maybe if we just take that. someone in the corner over. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Great. We'll take them maybe three at a time. Thank you. My name is Klaus Glaser. I'm working for a Viennese Austrian based asset management company. And my question is uh, concerning Mr. Borgdorf. He said, speaking about an oil uh, uh, pipeline project. If we would sell it, nobody, nothing will change because somebody else buys it. Well, this is obvious. Uh, and this statement was uncontradicted. So I want to contradict it because isn't this the statement exactly the opposite of what El Gore meant today when he spoke about fiduciary duty? on ESG risk or even moral responsibility because saying, well, I don't do anything, I wait uh, until the company does changes is uh, not uh, 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 in the a fiduciary duty of an investment manager, at least as a responsible investment manager. Thank you, and I'll just take on um, that. I can just take that question down um, here as well, thanks, and then the one in the corner. Thank you. Is there someone with a mic that can, thanks. Thank you, James, for trying to race, da race down here. <laughs> it's great, it's just down there. Thank you. Hello, Chris Fox from Series. One of the uh, items, this question is for um, Dr. Challenger from uh, Allianz. One of the items on the investor agenda is uh, phase out of investment in thermal coal. So I'm just interested in the decision process that you went through, why did Allianz decide to exclude coal and, and also the underwriting of coal? Thank you. And we'll just take on the other question over there, I think. Uh, Jason Masters from United Financial Services. My question's probably more to Angela, but happy for anybody else's comment. Angela, if I look at um, the Australian government scenario, 10 years, we are unable to have an energy policy. If I look at the parallel of the same-sex marriage debate, the corporate worlds got together and basically said, basically, stuff your governments, we're getting together and we're, we're going to do something, we're going to make a statement. Do you think in, say, the Australian context and perhaps in other countries, businesses, perhaps with the leadership of our type of organisations, rather than being picked off one by one like AGL has been, that we get together with the organisations we invest in and basically say, government, too late, we as an industry are going to actually set the energy policy in Australia. Okay, 
great, thank you. So um, I think we had um, a question that was around um, phase out of thermal coal. Um, and also I think that maybe ties together with the first question we had, um, which was around, um, which was also around um, coal, I think, and exclusion, um, and the fit with fiduciary duty. I think in response to Peter's comment earlier, so this is a, a, a great topic for us to be discussing. So maybe if we start with that first, um, Gunther. Yeah, regarding uh, you, you, why we came up with coal, actually, uh, as I uh, explained earlier, we are really very much into uh, engaging. But in some cases, uh, we simply believe that uh, there is not much of engaging because it's simply uh, too much of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and we just need to get out. Uh, this explains also a little bit how difficult it is uh, to do exclusion because you really need to get an assessment what is too much uh, over a certain period of uh, time. Um, and that was, uh, I would say, the uh, very simple analytic process uh, behind it. Thank you, um, and, and Gunther. And did you did you have any concerns about fiduciary duty when you um, were making the decisions? That, that's interesting, actually. Concerns about the fiduciary duty. We actually do the whole thing because we believe in the fiduciary duty. This, the, 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 the story is really we we do believe we do this for our policyholders. If, if, if somebody actually doesn't want to have uh, an ESG compliant investment then most certainly our recommendation would be don't take our products. Thank you. Would anyone else like to um, respond to that one? Peter. Yeah, the question was to me, so uh, I'd like to answer um, because uh, I understand the question. Why do we invest in, in oil when you, when you want to change the world? And when we hear the story of Mr. Gore, we should all skip uh, oil. I understand the question, and there was an applause, so I think a lot of people in the, in, the, in the audience think so. But we think the world won't change only when we skip our investments in, in fossil fuel. We think the world will change when all the companies will change, and in our engagement processes, we will help the, uh, to convince the, the companies to change the policy. For example, Shell, Royal uh, Dutch Oil. Um, uh, is this, at this moment establishing a very big research center in the headquarters in The Hague, just about renewable energy. When we skip Shell, it's a, of course, it's a, it's, we can do so, but it doesn't make the renewable energy possible by Shell. So I think when we are involved, we can change the world together. But that doesn't mean that we will keep all the fossil fuel in our portfolio. I'm sure that in a few years, I think two years, we won't have coal anymore. We skip energy uh, plants where they use coal instead of gas or, or other uh, fuel. Uh, but when the world is really changed, like Mr. Kors told us, that we only use renewable energy like solar and wind and water perhaps, uh, that's the best for us all. But it takes time, and during that time, we want to reduce carbon and uh, less and less till uh, there is no carbon needed anymore in our uh, energy. So for us, it's a, it's an, you can say a policy that we want to be involved in changing the world, and not only say, wash our hands clean and uh, let the rest uh, take care for himself. Mm. Angela, what's your perspective? Well, we're very much of the same view that we want to engage with companies rather than just completely divest of them um, and that the, the best for the long-term future. I think the way we've tackled it is in two ways. We've actually divested a couple of years ago, divest, we didn't actually own it, but we've said that we will not own any new thermal coal and what that has done is actually changed the conversation with our fund managers. It's actually got them thinking about coal. It's changed the com conversation in the, the political environment. So that, that's one thing that we've done. And we also have an investment option um, called the Echo Pool, which our members can actually choose. So we have actually done a very comprehensive divestment from fossil fuels in that particular option. So if members really feel strongly about this, they can choose um, our Echo Pool, which actually, by the way, has performed um, very well since it was established in, in 2000. So it's, a, it's probably a testament to um, the returns that come from investing sustainably. 
And Angela, would you mind just also tying in maybe a response to the question on, I think it was around the long, along the lines of shouldn't investors and businesses get together and do it in Australia? <laughs> yeah, oh, I do completely agree. It would be great. And I think, I, I think it's starting to happen. I was actually at an event, an Australian event last night um, with the Carbon Market Institute and a whole lot of companies that were really uh, dedicated to working on this issue. So it is happening, but we still have quite a lot of vested interests. Um, that, that are very powerful, um, and uh, I, I think uh, it really feels, I, I hope it's kind of their last gasp, um, yeah. uh, uh, and that we can move on to make progress in the near term on those sorts of issues, but I completely agree. Um, so um, I just also wanted to clarify PRI's approach towards um, thermal coal powers. I think it's emerged as a bit of um, a hot topic, um, although our initial focus was low carbon opportunities. But as it's come up, so I think our perspective is that there are actually some real risks around thermal coal. Um, and I really encourage you to read some excellent financial analysis that Carbon Tracker Initiative have done with the stranded assets um, risk-based perspective, really worth reading. Um, and um, another thing that um, is worth looking out for is in um, the thought leadership paper I mentioned, um, the inevitable policy response, um, we actually put forward the idea of um, engaging with companies on decommissioning. So I know that sounds radical, but we put it out there deliberately um, to really encourage some critical thinking um, around this, and just transition has to be a core part of this. Um, so I want to now um, just uh, wrap up some of what we've heard. So my sense is we've made a real start in terms of low-carbon investment. Um, the opportunities are out there. There is a long way to go. Um, the investor agenda, which we've developed with our seven partners, um, and will be profiled tomorrow, gives a way for us to see where are we, um, how much further can we go um, every year, as we'd like to keep the investor um, agenda um, going um, out for um, uh, a few more years if um, investors and um, uh, external stakeholders continue to find it um, valuable. I hope what you've got from this panel is that um, the leading investors really are um, moving forwards. CalPERS, Beth, you described um, the energy optimization, problem solving. Um, uh, at Allianz, Gunter, you've been very, very clear. I um, mean, you know, you've got your 2040 goals, science-based targets that you're going to push forward um, and um, uh, encouraging um, more um, industry collaboration and focus in the initiatives that have taken on. Um, Andrew, I think you outlined your long-term strategy, despite the government, um, the need for policy certainty around this. Um, and Peter, I think you um, described very clearly your focus that you've got on um, the members' um, climate, real-world assets, and um, real-world impact. And so so come finally the momentum in the Chinese um, market. Um, but as you all said, we need more on um, carbon pricing. Um, we need more collaboration, but those opportunities are out there um, today, um, and um, there is a lot to be had. So I want to finish just by asking you very, very briefly, more broadly on climate. Um, we all know we have to do more, um, but prioritization is also very important. What's your top priority on climate for the next 12 months? I'll just start with you, Beth. Oh. On climate generally, I mean, CalPERS is very involved in the Climate Action 100 initiative, so I would say that that's one piece of it. Um, and again, this is looking internal to our portfolio on that. Also, I mentioned our, we got, a, a, I think, a nice start on our energy optimization, but we're working on really making that a systematic approach by incorporating it into a policy or a plan for our external managers. So that's kind of a key, those are two key things okay. we're doing. Gunther? Well, as I said before, the, we, we really believe the whole portfolio needs to embark on a climate resilient path. That's what we actually want to achieve, which is, I believe, a little bit more than 12 months. <laughs> Angela. Uh, we're, we're really looking to build out our climate transition um, action plan um, and really looking to at how we further integrate our long term or a long horizon investing approach into that in terms of really looking more deeply at risk and uh, opportunity in climate. Thank you. Peter? To continue to reduce the carbon footprint to 50% in two years, uh, that's uh, our main uh, uh, objective. The second is to uh, quadruple uh, the, uh, the investment in solutions and that comes also to climate and at the end to build a livable world for our children, grandchildren. Thank you very much. Stalkman? 
to outreach more to the like-minded organizations to share and also show them to do responsible investment does not need to sacrifice return. <laughs> Thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to thank my um, panelists and um, I'm going to pass on to Fiona. Thank you. Thank you.